Welcome to the Butterfly Effect. I'm Chris Horner. This is stage 11 of the Vuelta España, 191 kilometers, about 120 miles in length. Now, this should be a sprinter stage, but when we start getting down here in the south of Spain, the wind can always come up and cause some kind of chaos. Today's course has no categorized climbs, no KOMs, that is, but does have some bumps and some small hills going up through today's stage. So along with the wind, anything is possible, but the organizers from the Vuelta a España, clearly, when they put on a stage like this, they're hoping for some massive wind to cause some chaos. And if not, then you know it's going to be a field sprint. Now, right away, when I sit on the couch and I'm watching the t television, what I'm seeing is that the COVID has spread massive because Simon Yates is out from Bike Exchange. He was fifth on the general classification. And Pavel Sivakov from Team Enos, ninth on the classification, he's out. Now, along with those two riders being out, three riders from Kern Farmer will catch COVID and they'll leave the race too. That's taken more than 20 riders, COVID positive at this stage at the Vuelta España, out. And about 30 riders just thereabouts that have abandoned throughout this year's 2022 Vuelta España. Now, when the racing starts, we're 110 kilometers into the race and the cameras come on. There's three riders up the road and they have a two and a half minute gap to the peloton being led behind. Those three riders up the road are in the form of Yetzi Bull from Burgos BH, Wojtek Repa from Kern Pharma, Jean Beau from Escatel Escadi. And when we look back at the peloton at two and a half minutes, we see that there's four teams chasing back there, big teams, all sprinters. So we know what the MO is going to be like on today's stage. It's going to be a field sprint because with those teams chasing from Trek Segafredo, along with Arkea Samsic, Albacine de Kunick for Tim Miller, Bike Exchange for Caden Groves. They're going to get a little more help with Bora Hansgro later in the race. Once the time gap starts dropping down a little more, we'll see Bora Hansgro chasing too. So that's five big teams on there. You know it's going to be a field sprint. Now, when we get into 65 kilometers to go, we're going to see a crash up front from Repa that's in the break. He's first guy going through that left turn. We see his front tire wash out, and he slides all the way across the road. The other two riders just barely miss him. They'll continue, and they'll wait along for Repa, who will come back up and get back up to that front group to make it three still chasing with about a minute and a half, minute and 45 second gap at this point in time in the race. Now, when we spend some time looking at the picture there, Repa, he doesn't have much scars on him, and that's because these roads are crazy slippery. Remember I talked about that yesterday on the butterfly effect for the TT, is that the most important thing in the time trial was to stay upright going through these corners. They're crazy slippery, and it's not going to be too much longer before we see the peloton coming through this same town, and there's going to be another crash. To my eyes, it looks like it was Plap that went down first from Team Ineos, but I could be wrong. That's not factual there. But then we'll see Julian Alaphilippe goes into the rider in front of him. It's going to flip over the bars, and Julian Alaphilippe's going to abandon on today's race. We see he had medical coverage around him right away, but we see him always touching the shoulder back there. And when they're loading him up in the ambulance, there's going to be a bunch of knuckleheads there loading up Julian Alaphilippe because all of a sudden the cart is going to take a brut stop and we're going to see Julian Alaphilippe give out a big yell because he's not too happy about the ambulance emergency crews putting him into the back of the van there and that thing coming to a brut stop. Well, after that yelling, we'll see the doors close and Julian Alaphilippe's race here at the Vuelta España is over. Hopefully, there's some kind of cure before the World Championships, but at this point in time, you got to believe that's probably the end of the season for Julian Alaphilippe if there is a major fracture broken there in the, in the collarbone, either being with a clavicle or something in the shoulder up there of an issue. One way or the other, though, best of luck to Julian Alaphilippe. I'd love to see you back at the races here after the Vuelta a España, especially at the World Championships. Guys, everybody remembers last year's World Championships with Julian Alaphilippe's French team just destroying the Belgium super, super team there at the World Championships in Belgium. This is a big blow to cycling, watching Julian Alaphilippe getting taken off in the ambulance. Now we get back into the action. It's 50 kilometers to go, and we're going to see a Jetsy Bull from Burgos BH that throws in attack. He goes up the road solo. What's really kind of strange about this is they're pulling the cars out between the breakaway and the peloton because the gap's down to about a minute. And as they're pulling the cars, Yeti Bull's going up the road, giving a draft to the other two riders to bring him back, but clearly they don't have any legs as they blow and can't bring him back. And now we got one solo rider up the road from Yeti Bull. Yeti Bull's trying to put on the display, but there's too many teams back there controlling the race, and they'll bring him back with about 
30, about 27 kilometers to go, if I remember right, because it was about 30 kilometers to go when the peloton started getting nervous and going curb to curb and really starting to pick up the pace. Now, the big obstacle in today's course when we're talking about the finish line is going to be the last four kilometers because it goes along the coast. So that means you could get wind conditions that can string the field out or cause crosswinds and just blow the field up as we're coming into the final four kilometers. So when we see with five kilometers ago, there's a massive curb to curb fight from the Peloton as we see the GC teams from Jumbo Visma leading into this roundabout left turn that's going to decide who's going to, who could possibly win here on stage four. Now when we see them coming out, Jumbo Visma had control going in and shortly afterwards coming out, it's bike exchange on the front. Lawson Craddock, the American kid, he's on the front driving at 100% and he's got three teammates with him. Keelan O'Brien's there, Hepburn's there, and of course their sprinter Caden Grove's there. Now they'll get a little bit of help with Team Enos as we see the Team Enos rider Dylan Van Barley slot in there and at about just under three kilometers to go, we're going to see Lawson Craddock do his final pull and he's going to swing off hard to the right side of the road. Now we'll see it's Dylan Van Barley from Team Enos that's on the front. Dylan's going fast, 58 kilometers an hour along this coastal stretch into the finish of today's stage 11 of the Vuelta España. When the Enos rider pulls off, that's going to leave three bike exchange riders on the front. You got Keelan O'Brien there, you got Hepburn there, and of course their sprinter Caden Groves. Only problem is from two kilometers out, this is too far to go for only two riders to get a sprinter into the finish. So this tells you when you're sitting on the couch that bike exchange main MO, their plan A is to keep... Their sprinter, Caden Groves, out of trouble and at the front of the peloton for as long as possible. They're not trying to do a perfect lead out here on stage 11 of the Vuelta España. They're just hoping to get him into about one kilometer to go and keep him out of trouble for as long as possible. Now, Keelan O'Brien does an amazing work on the front because he throttles it back down a little bit because he knows he can't go all the way into the finish. So he's hoping there's some going to be some help. And it does. It comes in the form of Albacine de Kunic. The rider comes up here at the front. I don't know who it is, but I know it's not the right technique here if you want to win because his sprinter is way back there, Tim Miller, in about 10th position all the way on the left side of the road. This is not the time you want to be pulling on the front. Now the Albacine de Kunic rider will just pull up there a little bit, helping the bike exchange riders keep their rider, Caden Groves, their sprinter, out of the wind and out of trouble here when we're getting under 1.5 kilometers to go. Albacine de Kunic rider will pull off. That's going to leave Keelan O'Brien on the front again and guess what? As he slows the pace down, it starts to fan out. Coming through the middle is another Albacine de Kunic rider. We'll see him look left over his shoulder to try to find out where his sprinter Tim Miller is, but he's not in the picture because he's too far back. The Albacine de Kunic rider is going to do the same mistake his teammate did. He's going to go to the front and do one big hard pull up there at the front for the bike exchange riders. That means Keelan O'Brien, who should have been on the front all the way from about one, but about probably 2.1 kilometers to go. Now he's had help from multiple Albacine de Kunic riders to get him far and deep into this stage 11 because the Albacine de Kunic rider is going to pull all the way to about 800 kilometers to go. Now all of a sudden when he pulls off, we're going to see Keelan O'Brien start his real acceleration on the front. He, of course, has got some teammates on his wheel in the form of Michael Hepburn and, of course, their sprinter Caden Groves, who's been out of the wind throughout this final four kilometers on this stage 11. So Bike Exchange are getting a gift here with help all over from the form of Team Enos and from the form of Albacine de Kunic. Now, as we see Keelan O'Brien starting to finish his final pull, he pulls all the way to about 700 meters to go, and he's going to start to pull off just at the same point in time as Alex Kirsch from Trek Segafredo, along with his teammate Mads Pedersen in the green points jersey, they start accelerating to the front. With the rider up front pulling off from bike exchange, we see Alex Kirsch. He's got a swing around the hard right side there out in the wind, but he's got a sprinter on his wheel, Mads Pedersen. They will miss the bike exchange rider, Keelan O'Brien, and then they'll pull back over to the left side of the road where all of a sudden we see it's bike exchange on the front with Michael Hepburn. Now, Alex Kirsch does an amazing job right here because he brings Mads Pedersen all the way up and onto the wheel of the sprinter, Caden Groves. Then we see Alex Kirsch gets out of the way. Now, all of a sudden, we start seeing some more attacks because it's starting about 350 meters to go. 
We're going to see it's DSM rider John Dagenkolb throwing in a long range attack. He's throwing in a big tack and on his wheel he's got Milano from UAE Team Emirates. Now we saw it start seeing Tim Miller coming into the picture, but Tim Miller is doing a big job. He had to come all the way from way back 10th position on the left side of the road. Now he's found his way over to the right side of the road and starting to sprint, but he's been out in the wind now for about 300. 50 meters to go and up front as we see John Dagan Colt he starts to die and all of a sudden Sebastian Milano is normally the lead out man UA team Emirates lead out man for Pascal Ackerman but Ackerman's nowhere to be found so Milano's going 100% at about 300 meters to go now with that happening it was McClay from Arkea Samsek who followed the duel of John Dagan Colt and Sebastian Milano and now McClay starting to throw in his own accelerations as Caden Groves has switched off his teammate's wheel and he's following the Arkea Samsic wheel of Dan McClay. Now behind we start seeing as the sprinters coming from the back it's Tim Miller. He's finally into the picture but he's out in the wind and we're talking about 275, 250 meters to go as he's out there. Now with 150 meters to go all of a sudden Caden Groves knows it's time to kick it in. He'll start to accelerate 125. He's got full road in front of him as he's moved all the way out to the right side he's starting to pass Dan McClay and then all of a sudden he's just got the rider in front of him Milano but Milano's been doing a long effort Milano starts to fade all of a sudden Caden Groves is in the picture now right behind Caden Groves Tim Miller is in the picture it looks like he's trying to give the bike exchange rider a run for the money and then just behind on the left side threading the needle if you look at the picture all of a sudden you see it's Danny Van Poppel there he was leading out Sam Bennett but Sam Bennett left yesterday's individual time trial with COVID positive test so he's out of the race. Danny Van Poppel after threading the needle there he makes it through. Now all of a sudden we got a sprint to the line because it's a bike throw from Bike Exchange. Caden Groves the Australian rider who wins the stage second on the stage Bora Hansgro Danny Van Poppel third on the stage to round out the podiums. Tim Miller my favorite to win today's stage but he had a bunch of knucklehead lead outs here from Albacine to Kunick that just helped Bike Exchange all the way into the line. Set up Caden Groves in perfect position all the way throughout today's final stage with four kilometers to go in this race. Now afterwards we see the interview from Caden Groves. He's incredibly motivated and excited obviously because he won stage 11 here at the Vuelta España and this is his first Grand Tour victory. Now he's had some great wins, one in Catalonia if I remember correctly, throughout this year but he doesn't have any Grand Tour wins and if you're a pure sprinter there is no better place to win than at the Grand Tours World Championships and clearly the Tour de France is the big place on the Champs-Élysées if you want to be the, considered one of the best. Today's stage, sleeper stage, nothing happened. You could have slept through the whole race. But there was a lot of drama when we're talking about the COVID positives from Simon Yates leaving and, of course, Pavel Sivakov. And then the finish of today's stage, it was chaos all over. It was a hard race to call, actually, up here on the Butterfly Effect because so much had happened at the finish. So if you want to watch today's race, definitely want to watch from about 5 kilometers, maybe go 10 if you got a little bit of extra time, and watch the finish of today's stage. Anything beyond that, really, two crashes that happened, the one being Julian Alaphilippe, the most one at 65 kilometers to go, that'll have a effect here moving forward when we're talking about Remco Evnepoel from his quick step team. Keep in mind it was Julian Alaphilippe destroying the field on stage 9 going up that last 3.9 kilometers that set up Remco Evnepoel's solo ride all the way up to the finish to set a dominating display of climbing here at the Vuelta España. So quick step or down not one but two riders because Peter Siri left the race earlier here in the Vuelta España for COVID positive. Keep that in mind. We're moving forward. Tomorrow's a big mountain stage. Final climb. Almost 200 kilometer stage. I believe it's the longest in the Vuelta España. And it's going to have a summit finish. So Quick Step got their work cut out for them with two riders down. That means they only have six riders left in the race. But they do have the best rider in the world at this moment in time. Remco Avnipol wearing the race leader's red jersey. Make sure you guys like and subscribe. There'll be some more good races and for sure a GC battle on tomorrow's stage 12 of the Vuelta España. See you then.